Hello and welcome to the webinar, Gender Mainstreaming, Addressing Gender Inequality, offered by the UN Women Training Center. This webinar will provide a sneak peek into our course on gender mainstreaming. Your presenter today is Alicia Siffer, Training Program Coordinator at the UN Women Training Center. Alicia is from Argentina and specializes in gender and public policy. She studied education at the University of Buenos Aires. During and after the presentation, you may post questions on the question box provided by the GoToWebinar application. We will take note of these questions and will make an effort to respond during the Q&A portion of the webinar. We want you to know that this webinar will be recorded and the PowerPoint made available for those who could not join us today, and that further information regarding the content provided here or regarding the course can be requested via email at info dot training center at unwomen.org. I will now hand it over to Alicia Siffer so she can begin her presentation. Thank you very much, Anel, and welcome everybody to this webinar um, on gender mainstreaming in which we want to share more about, um, about our course, our present course that we're, we'll be started very will be starting very soon on gender mainstreaming. But we wanted to also take this opportunity to discuss more about what gender mainstreaming is and the different strategies, the background, and um, the concepts that uh, on, this, um, on this strategy to include gender issues and to achieve gender equality. So um, several intergovernment there are several intergovernmental decisions and global commitments towards gender mainstreaming. Gender mainstreaming is mandated in 1995 by the Beijing Platform of Act for Action as a strategic approach for achieving gender equality and women's empowerment at all levels of development. The platform commits all stakeholders in development policies and programs, including United Nations entities, member states, the international development community, and civil society actors to take action. More specifically, in the, the Beijing Platform for Action notes, government says that governments and other actors should promote an active and visible policy of mainstreaming a gender perspective in all policies and programs, so that before decisions are taken, an analysis is made of the effects on women and men respectively. The Beijing Platform for Action proposes a dual strategy, as you can see. Um, this dual strategy entails a combination of both gender-targeted approaches and gender-integrated approaches. Um, gender mainstreaming was very well defined by the ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Cons Council of the, UN, of the UN, um, in 1997. And it's defined as the process of assessing the implications for women and men of any planned action, including legislation, policies and programs in all areas and at all levels. It is a strategy for making women as well as men's concerns and experiences an integral dimension of the design, implementation, monitoring and evaluation of policies and programs in all political, economic and social spheres so that both men and women can benefit equally from development and inequality is not perpetrated. The ultimate goal is to achieve gender equality. So this is um, a first point where I would like to make, um, I'd like to emphasize that gender mainstreaming is a strategy. The end, what we're trying to achieve is gender equality, is the empowerment of women, is the equal, uh, is that both men, women, young children, aging uh, people, different groups benefit from development equally. Further, in, in, and more presently, the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development also calls for the systematic mainstreaming of gender perspective in the implementation of the agenda. The agenda, as you know, presents 17 goals, one of which addresses gender issues and the advancement of women specifically. But the agenda also proposes that um, 
gender must be mainstreamed along all the other uh, sustainable development goals. So we now have a perfect a framework for mainstreaming actions into development policies, for mainstreaming gender, sorry, into this development policies, into programs, and into different strategies. So, a little bit more about what is gender mainstreaming and what is not gender mainstreaming. Gender mainstreaming is not about adding a component, a women's component, just like okay, we will also target women, or we will also add a group on women. And it's not only about increasing women's participation, although it includes women's participation, it goes beyond the mere participation. It is about bringing the experience, the knowledge, and the interests of women and men to bear on the development agenda. So it means that our programs and projects will adopt a more participatory um, a approach and focus. It is also to develop, to modify the development agenda so the results will benefit men and women equally. Many times when we have a non-sensitive gender program, a, a gender-blind program, when we include gender, then we see that we have to start, it's not just adding, the whole project or program might be transformed. So it's not only in increasing women's participation, but it is to transform the social and institutional unequal structures so that um, both men and women can benefit equally. So, um, as you know, as I mentioned before, gender mainstreaming has been ongoing and been implemented in our projects and pro programs, in public policies, in institutions, with different degrees and in different levels. And after 20 years, maybe, or more, um, of of more emphatic, let's say, of, of more emphasized gender mainstreaming, we have some ideas, we have been documented, we have some conclusions, we can learn about what we have been doing, we can learn about our successes and about our achievements as well. So some of these um, lessons learned, uh, documented through the years, include, uh, are, are what I'm going to tackle in the next slide. One thing is that um, gender analysis of the context of the intervention is key to start. We need to look at the situation, at the context. The context analysis needs to incorporate gender lenses to identify the issues that we need to address. If we don't do the gender analysis, the gender inequalities will remain invisible. But it's very key that once we have identified these issues of inequalities, we can include them in the results framework. So it's a key process to be able to transform this inequality as something, that, as a result that we aim to achieve. We need to incorporate it into our, our results framework. Gender has to be then included throughout the whole project cycle, starting from the analysis, the design, the development, the monitoring, and the evaluation. This means that we will need um, to include it as high as possible in our results uh, framework meaning outcomes or outputs. In a results-based management perspective, we report on results. We report on our outcomes or on the outputs. So if we don't include them there and we just include gender as an activity, as many times happens, the results on gender will be lost because we, are, we report and our indicators are very much uh, linked to the results we aim to integrate. So this means that we need gender-sensitive indicators as well. Uh, gender-sensitive indicators means that we need to have gender-disaggregated data, but we are, it also means that we sometimes need to address to have more qualitative results, more qualitative indicators as well. Another uh, aspect I would like to point out is the uh, gender focal points and units. Um, 
there is a tendency that we, when there is a gender focal point or a gender specialist or a gender unit, there is a, sometimes a tendency to believe, okay, this unit, this person will address the gender issues in the programs. And this is not so. Gender is a responsibility of everybody. But what is true and has been identified, for example, UN Women undertook a, um, an assessment, a study of all uh, Millennium Development Goal Fund programs. It was a special program, um, a, a special fund uh, funded by, um, uh, supported by the Spanish government earlier on, and we looked at all the different programs and projects, the, pro the project documents. We identified that where there was a gender focal point, a gender specialist assigned, or you and women was part of the program, there was a stronger incorporation, a stronger integration of a gender perspective of gender issues in the project document. So while we don't want to have one person that will be solely responsible for this issue and it's everybody's responsibility. It is true that when we have a gender focal point or when we have capacity to integrate gender, this is done in a, in a stronger manner, in a better manner, in a, it's enhanced. Then it's also important to, uh, to bear in mind uh, women's uh, participation in the decision making. It's when working at community level, both men and women need to be included in all the phases of the project. And finally, um, gender responsive budgeting is what I always think of as the final frontier. When we include gender in a budget, we know it's the most that definite way of in mainstreaming gender, because when we include um, gender, th this brings in the budget, it brings an accountability in itself. What is in the budget needs to be spent um, and need to be, um, to be included definitely and we need to and we are accountable for those actions. So this is something key that where we gender markers and gender integration into the um, budget helps us um, uh, make gender mainstreaming stronger. So as we see, um, it's many times we need resources. We need human, we always need human resources, we need capacity, we need financial resources, we need to uh, strengthen capacity of everybody involved in the, in, the, in the project, but many times it doesn't mean that we have to invest an incredible amount of money that is additional to the original project. Many times it means that we need to think things out differently. Um, as you might have uh, seen from now, gender mainstreaming, there's no recipe, there are many different roads and it's more like an art and uh, trying to combine different elements than following the recipe. It's more like creating a new dish every time than just applying the recipe each time. Of course, there are things that we need to know. There are certain steps that we need to take, there are certain checklists that will help us um, ensure that we are complying with the different elements, that we are including gender in the different aspects. There are guidelines that can help us. But it's also a question of practice and improvement and strengthening capacities of everybody involved. In a way, it's like trying to make things differently um, to have different results. Uh, we will, it, it also means that there are a change of mindsets needs to be uh, to take place, that we need to raise awareness, that we have to be able to have somebody once said in a, in a course, the aha moment. We have to be able to see those situations where gender is, um, is where there is an inequality in gender, where gender is not addressed and then we have a discrimination issue. So, um, so 
a little bit more into um, into looking into gender mainstreaming in policies, programs, and institutions. We can address, we can include gender issues in public policy, in legislation, in normative frameworks, and we can also implement them in uh, in programs, in projects for development for, on all different matters, on all different as aspects. We can include gender in infrastructure or we can include gender in health projects and programs and policies as well. Some certain um, aspects of integrating gender is are more clearly identified, are more easily seen. It is easier to understand that women will have specific needs regarding reproductive health. It is easy to understand that they will there will be certain policies that will be addressed to them. But we can also we also have to go on thinking about all the different aspects of lives, and that we that gender their inequality has an impact on women, on men, on the whole population in different situations. So as I was mentioning before, the Beijing Platform for Action calls upon this dual strategy uh, that needs to be implemented based on a gender analysis that brings out um, the specific situations and that from there we choose what the right um, intervention would be. A specific capacity strengthening program uh, aimed at women participating in political life or wanting to be parliamentarians, for example, could be an example of a targeted intervention on women to support them participating in, in, in and, and accessing to parliament. But most probably this will not be enough. Just strengthening capacity will not be enough. We will also have to address more structural inequalities and implement other measures such as quotas for political participation. Um, for example, but I would also like to point out um, other other um, examples that are not so common. There's a very nice video that I recommend everybody to see. It's fortunately available in both English and Spanish, and it was um, developed by the Swedish local governments um, councils, and it addresses gender mainstreaming in practice. Um, this video brings up an example on public transport. We all know that using public transportation at night might be specifically more dangerous for women than for men. So in, in, a, in one city in Sweden, um, the pub, taking public, um, when taking public buses at night, there was a policy that women could ask the bus driver to stop at any specific point of the route. It didn't need to be a bus stop and it could be just 10 meters after a, a bus stop. They could go, they would, women would go down, the bus driver would stop, women would go down at that specific point and the bus driver had to check that nobody else would go down at the same point. Women were allowed to go down at the uh, through the front door so that the bus driver could be more attentive uh, so there was more surveillance at the moment when she went down so she could choose where to go so that she had to walk less at night and she could choose the safer w uh, route to walk home. This increased the um, use of women of public transportation at night by women. It, it increased their safety and it also allowed women to be more independent and to continue I mean doing uh, what they were interested in doing in a way. No? But and it doesn't and this specific measure nothing more than a specific order, a specific moment, uh, it's not even a, a training, just a communication to drivers and a communication to women so that this could be implemented. There was no additional budget involved. Um, uh, so also 
we need to think of, when we think about energy, infrastructure, any policy, we need to reflect how this will affect women, children, aging people differently. And I, here I would like to add an additional layer of complexity. Um, we understand, there's a general understanding and we, we all know that there's not one type of woman. There's not one type of men either. Um, women, issues like race, uh, special, specific, special needs, ethnic groups, religion, sexual preference, age, identity, uh, regional context, they all add to conform a very complex reality. Um, these factors need to be considered when we analyze um, the needs of a specific group or the impact of a specific in intervention or when we're planning implementation of specific actions. If our project involves, for example, meetings with, a communi with community members, um, what time are we going to plan these meetings? We need to make sure that the time and place we, um, that we decide upon will enable both men, women, and, the different, and all the different people involved to attend. If our project calls for involvement of local leaders, how are we defining leadership? How are we defining, who are we considering as local leaders? We have to be um, careful not to just address traditional male leadership uh, that will maybe invisibilize other processes, other, uh, other actors that are also having, are also working in the community and having an, inter an impact. In humanitarian contexts, to give another um, example, when we have a camp um, for displaced per, uh, people, persons, where are we setting up the washroom facilities? Is it in a well-lighted setting so that women and girls can have access to, um, to it safely? Um, so these are all considerations that we don't, that we need to take uh, into um, that we need to, to take note of and address as well. And um, so finally, so we, I would like to uh, talk more about gender mainstreaming in institutions. Uh, institutions can be public institutions, can be corporations, can be companies. I wanted to share with you today um, an initiative that is part of the He for She initiative um, and campaign of UN Women. It's called Impact 10 by 10 by 10 and this, uh, uh, this initiative seeks to gain further momentum in advancing gender equality and women's political and economic empowerment. It was launched um, over a year ago as a pilot effort and at first it wanted to engage 10 governments, 10 corporations and 10 uni universities as an instrument of change that would implement actions internally towards the promotion of gender equality in a global change. So this is an, this is an initiative to look within the organizations. I'm using this as an example to show what, um, what can be done, what uh, actions can be implemented within uh, organizations. So here you can see the 10 different companies um, that were initially part of this um, initiative and uh, I would like to um, go a little bit uh, in more into um, one of the companies, which is Twitter. I think we all know um, Twitter by now. It's a platform for public self-expression and conversation in real time. Um, just to, you know, I, I was struck because we all know how big it is, but it uses 35 languages and 320 million active users every month. So. What did this company uh, do as part of this initiative? There was analysis of the a situation analysis of the company before. When mainstreaming gender in an organization, it always starts with an institutional analysis of what the current situation is. It's the same way as in a project and program where we start with a situational analysis of where of the situation that we want to address with a program. So, um, 
so the, the, the company first underwent this assessment, identified current issues and situations and made some commitments. So what were these commitments that, that were made? To build a pipeline of women, to increase gender diversity across the tech organization because there was very, the representation of women was very low. In 2015, women comprised only 34% of the global workforce at Twitter and 13% were technical roles and only 22% were senior leadership. So this was addressed and there was a commitment to, uh, to, uh, to increase the representation of women to an overall 35% in 2016, rising up to 16% in the technical roles and 25% in the leadership roles. Um, this was a commitment made for one year. Um, also, other commitments were to increase, um, to leverage the Twitter platform towards, to drive towards the heap for she um, targets. So, what were the actions taken? Um, implementing wor work-life balance policies and programs. Uh, this means that um, that certain strategies are made so that um, staff personnel can balance better their personal lives and also their work life. Paid parental leave benefits, um, giving mothers up to 20 weeks of, full, of fully paid leave in the US. Um, holding roundtables also to bring together women around the company uh, so that um, there could be a, a, a larger drive and increasing uh, the representation of women, including nursing rooms, uh, child care, pet care, senior care. I want to make a, a specific um, point here because senior we are more aware about um, many times about child care, which is certain it is normally a role that is um, uh, given to women naturally because of our traditional roles. Uh, senior care and taking care of our elders is also a, a, a burden that comes to women. Providing senior care, home care, child care in, organi in companies allows for both men and women to benefit from this and also helps balance the traditional roles bringing, uh, giving both sort of equaling more, bringing both men and women in a more, in more similar um, uh, situations. So we are also not only um, providing for support for these care activities, but we are also demonstrating that both men and women have the equal responsibility in care, in, uh, in care activities and in care work. So what we are go the training center has developed a course on gender mainstreaming. I wanted to take an opportunity to share with you on the course that will start on uh, by the beginning of March. We will give um, and we will start on the sixth of March, which is a Monday. Here we have our um, timeline. So the applications are still open for this course which um, uh, covers five, uh, four modules, including basic concepts on gender mainstreaming, gender mainstreaming in programs and projects, gender mainstreaming in public policies, and gender mainstreaming in institutions. As it is a blended course, it has a four-week online a, a course that will be implemented through the e-learning campus of the training center. And, um, and a five-day face-to-face um, session that will be this time implemented in Geneva. We will um, confirm the venue within Geneva very soon. But um, in these four weeks online and in these five days face-to-face, -face, we will be going deep into, uh, into um, all the different aspects, the concepts, we will have practical work, uh, working with case studies, with um, real situations, and integrating gender into um, the different aspects of the training cycle, um, of, uh, of the 
developing policies and also of um, of integrating gender into institutions. Um, we will inc the uh, gender analysis will be included and also uh, including gender into the results framework from an RBM perspective as well. We will touch very lightly on gender responsive budgeting uh, because we will, um, we also, the training center also has a very specific and um, a, a, a specialized course on gender responsive budgeting, but this will be uh, tackled as well. And also monitoring and evaluation of gender based streaming will also be uh, tackled. We will be dealing with sectoral approaches in both traditional and non-traditional contexts because we know that there are certain um, different, uh, there are certain topics where it's easier to see how we can bring gender, but um, gender in telecommunications, gender in infrastructure, sometimes it's a little bit harder um, to, to visualize and to apply appropriately. In gender mainstreaming in institutions, we will also be uh, uh, tackling key organizational components, opportunities and challenges, including organizational culture, human resources, staff accountability, and incentives for gender mainstreaming, and also financial resources and budgets. Again, we will try to, um, uh, to bring in also the more non-traditional institutions. So, um, how do we apply for um, this course? Uh, the, there is, um, in th through the e-learning campus, you will um, find the uh, form, the application form to apply. The, co the course has a cost of uh, $1,500 dollars, US dollars, but there are scholarships available and also group discounts for staff or personnel from the same organization. The course will start early in March, but the deadline to apply and to pay the fees is by um, late February, so we can have time to, um, to uh, finalize all the, uh, the, the lists of participants and everything. So, um, I think I'm going to stop now and I will, um, so we have some time for some questions and, um, and to, uh, to respond questions, uh, any doubts that you might have, both some questions about um, gender mainstreaming in general and some questions also about uh, the course. Thank you very much. Here you can see the email that you can write to, to have um, a also to ask questions. Okay. Okay. Um, I think you can all see the uh, different questions that some participants um, can have uh, addressed. One of the questions was on the education of children and how to address gender issues. Uh, how can we best address, uh, how can best, how best can children be empowered with positive attitudes and mindsets of gender mainstreaming, especially in war-torn zones and areas? Well, as you all know, um, education is a very powerful tool and strategy to address any type of inequalities. Um, through our education is how we normally learn our traditional roles. So, um, so we can use in the same way education to empower girls and to also um, to also. Um, um, work with boys and young boys and I mean younger small children and youth to on more um, gender sensitive non-traditional and stereotypical roles what the sometimes we propose we have to check how what we propose boys and girls to do what um, do we divide the 
the, the activities in the classroom and we separate and we encourage boys more to do more science um, and girls to do more artistic or linguistic um, activities. What specific tasks of the life in a classroom do we give to boys and girls? So specifically in situations where um, there is a conflict or po post-conflict um, context, we can work with them to um, ensure that uh, we, to, to, to build skills, uh, lifelong sk learning skills, and to work with them on a non-hierarchical, non-discriminatory um, roles. Um, this is a very large topic in itself. But what I will do is share afterwards in the um, when we share the the video, I will share specific resources that can be um, that can be looked at to think about um, uh, to think about uh, uh, the the activities and, and this topic in specific. Um, so thinking Therese from London is also um, addressing, addressing the, a very important issue on the difference between equality and equity. And I thank you, Therese, for bringing this up because I think it's key to understand. Um, equality is our end, it's what we want to achieve. We want women and men and everybody in society to be able to um, have the same, um, to benefit equally from development and from the prog and from progress, let's say. Equities are specific measures that we implement at specific moments to address those inequality issues. So if we have gender mainstreaming can be a strategy to that is will address um, to achieve equality. Um, equ equity measures means that we will be targeting specific groups or we will have specific actions. Sometimes they are positive discrimination actions that will help us address those inequalities in the end. But equity is a means to achieve gender inequality. Um, it's actually this way, this strategy, this sometimes it's a tool to make sure that our unequal start is made equal. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, yes. Um, how do we uh, sometimes when we talk about gender mainstreaming, Hunter Gray says, the, the gender binary is reinforced because it seems that um, we are talking about men and women and when we talk about men and women it's only one, me one type of man and one type of woman and this is not so. We need to ensure that when we talk about gender we use the whole spectrum and we are meaning the whole spectrum. We are meaning transgender, we're meaning intersex, and, and this is also afterwards intersected by many other uh, factors, characteristics. We have also um, ethnic origin, we have also religion, we have also um, race, and there's no specific way, but when we look at it, when we do our gender analysis, we have to have an intersectional approach that will afterwards be sort of transferred and through the whole program cycle or through the design and implementation of our policies so that this is addressed. Because if we are reinforcing a just a gender binary, we are still excluding. It's not enough. Women and men, per se, as a general and an entity, is not is not enough anymore. So um, um, I will touch very lightly. I think that I have um, discussed a little bit the difference between gender integrated approaches and gender focused uh, approaches or, or, or women focused approaches. Sometimes we need a project to address a specific group that has a specific disadvantage and we need to work with that group to ensure that they are, um, that, that we, they are having equal opportunities um, 
compared to to the I don't want to say the rest, no, to compare to the whole population. And sometimes we don't need a targeted approach. We just need to make sure that when we are um, implementing a program or a project, we are addressing everybody's needs. It's one thing, sometimes we need to work with women directly, uh, with women single mothers directly, and sometimes we just need to make sure that everybody's needs are um, considered. Um, how can results monitoring systems be applied in gender-related projects to achieve the project objectives? Well, when we have, a, as I was mentioning, um, in the program cycle, gender is integrated into the whole program cycle. This means that we need to have, um, we need to have a um, gender-sensitive statistics and uh, that, that will help us address the issues that were identified and that will afterwards help us monitor um, the projects and see if we are really achieving the project objectives. One thing that is important in a results-based uh, management perspective is that we try to include at least one output or one outcome that it has a solid integration of gender or is gender focused or that we integrate gender in all um, all the all the outputs and outcomes or that at least there is one important outcome or output on gender. Um, this is something that um, allows us to know if we're achieving these results because gender equality is part of the results within this specific sectoral approach. Um, Anel, I don't know if you have other questions. Um, uh, I can see that there are a lot of Hi. Uh, comments. Yes. Hi, yes, Alicia. There are quite a few questions. I'm going to switch and I'm going to put in a few questions about the course because there are quite a few questions about gender mainstreaming. I think we can answer those on the follow-up email. Um, but I, I want to give a little bit of time to answer some questions about the course. So I will post them here right now and you can see them. Can you see them? Yes, I can see them. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, okay, so there are two parts of the course. First, there is an online course through the e-learning campus. Uh, we have a uh, we have a, a platform for learning that allows to interact um, and come together in the e-learning campus. The mostly the e-learning uh, the e online phase contains some readings and some forums for discussions and tasks that participants need to complete um, at their own time. There's each week we will tackle another topic and there will be specific readings and tasks for these uh, topics as well. Most of the tasks are done in an asynchronous manner, in by meaning that um, we will uh, not have to come together at the same time, for example, because we will also probably and hopefully have participants from all different parts of the world. So it will be difficult to all come together at the same time. So for this um, reason, you can go in online, you do your readings, and for example, there's a forum, you respond the questions, and you look for the information, you do the task at your own uh, pace. There will be some webinars that will uh, be at specific moments. We will try to choose best possible moments for everybody, although that is quite difficult. But as this same webinar, it will be recorded and then participants who were not able to access it uh, live will be able to um, to listen to it and, uh, and benefit from the webinar as well. Uh, when we have these four weeks online done, we go into the face-to-face. -face. The face-to-face -face is five days and it will be held, be held at Geneva. We need to come face-to-face -face there and you need to come to the to Geneva at that time. We're aware uh, that this has a different demand, uh, but coming face to face also allows for a different type of learning. What I want to point out is that um, 
we hope that you can all come to Geneva. Well, we have 444 participants. It would be a bit too much if everybody comes now, uh, but it would be lovely, wouldn't it? And um, but we will be holding the same course at different locations throughout the year and next year as well, because we know that um, traveling is expensive. So, um, in Anel, I will ask you if while I'm speaking, you can look for the link for the course registration. And I, what we will do is that we will send it to everybody who was able to connect today and those who were not able to connect but also signed up for the webinar. We will send the link for the course registration. Um, and okay, okay, so if you have applied uh, for the scholarship, we look and you haven't received a reply, you will soon do so. For the scholarship, you need to, compl to fill in the form and you need a letter of endorsement from the organization you're working. So once we receive that letter, that letter of endorsement and um, the motivation uh, letter and the application form completed, so it's a completing the application form, endorsement letter, motivation letter, and we look at the application and we respond almost immediately. I will, uh, we will, you, a lot, if you haven't received any communications, you will do so um, very soon. But if you haven't sent the endorsement letter or the application uh, or the motivation letter, please do so because maybe that's what we're waiting for, for you for, to respond. I want to highlight that um, because of the, following the policy for scholarships of the Young Women Training Center, we uh, scholarships are, are partial and we cannot cover the cost of um, traveling and staying and, 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 and the, I mean staying in Geneva during the course. The working hours for the online course, well I have said, they are very flexible. We expect each one of the participants to um, to dedicate between five to eight hours to the online phase and um, well during the face to face it's generally from approximately from nine to five um, uh, what else uh, there is a selection process um, we look for people who are able to, um, the participants of this course must have a little bit of gender knowledge and we can support. Um, also, some of you we see that we have, um, have not had so much experience in gender, so there are certain courses that you can take um, before coming to the the, the it, before even starting the online phase, these are uh, to support with the acquisition and understanding of the basic concepts. We will not be dealing with basic gender concepts during this course. We will understand that these are already this a common basis for everybody. So we have some online courses that are for free that will be um, uh, available. Um, and we will make available in each case as necessary. Um, uh, we, we support participants working within organizations um, because this also supports transformative practices within organizations and as you know we scholarships we are uh, a UN organization, our scholarships, we need to make sure that we can promote change with the scholarships that we are giving to. For us, this is an action, I mean it's training and it's also a positive action to advance gender equality. Participants will be giving us certificates after completing this course uh, by the UN Women Training Center and we do plan to hold this course afterwards um, in the year in different locations and also in southern locations. I can't, I, we are thinking, we're thinking about Bangkok, about Latin America and about Af locations in Africa as well. Um, the, 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 the time, the limit to apply for scholarships is the same as applying to the course, which I think is the uh, 
20, by the end of this week, I think, something like that. Anel, can, maybe you can um, confirm the specific dates. Uh, anybody from any uh, nationality can apply to the course. It's open to everybody. Uh, and we don't need, um, I'm, we, you don't need to have a, um, if you are in your, um, if you're your university start doing your university studies you can um, you can uh, also um, apply to the course you don't need to have a bachelor's degree to apply to the course um, finally here I think I see that Anel has um, included the deadline um, for application which is the 24th of February which is by the end of this week so I greatly encourage you to um, apply and you can start applying while you f look for endorsement letters that you might need. Uh, I think I have covered these questions on on the aspects of the training. I don't know if you have others Anel. Yes, participants will be given certificates after completing the course, yes. It's a certificate that includes both the online and the face-to-face -face part. Okay, I think it's Bangkok. I would like to do Panama and I would like to do somewhere in Africa. The, the fees do not include accommodation and uh, food while in Geneva. We include um, coffee breaks. And um, and uh, um, yes. So, are there any other questions or questions about? Because I'm also looking at the questions that they're posting live here. I don't know if there are any specific issues to address. Also, okay. Okay, specific recommendations on how to approach women's entrepreneurship through a gender mainstreaming approach. Okay, this is very complex. We have a few minutes, but I don't want to leave uh, it unanswered. But first of all, um, I think that well, I'm going to say something that I have mentioned before in the presentation. It's important to um, to start with a gender analysis. And when we talk about women's entrepreneurship, it's not that we're just, um, we have to think about the context, the cultural roles, what women can do and cannot do in a specific context. Um, what, uh, how are, are women entrepreneurs already? Are they what are their income generating strategies um, and we want to consider cultural and uh, aspects as well but what I want to point out is that um, it's not only about technical skills it's also about women's empowerment um, we need to consider what um, how we can um, how we can uh, support them in their in, in, and to to so that they can because we cannot empower anybody people empower become empowered by themselves how can they really be empowered of their own um, income generating activities so that they can make their also their own decisions um, the same as with the education that were very very specific questions I would like to share more afterwards um, on, on specific tools but I think that um, these are just some issues for considering Eligibility criteria for scholarship. Thank you, Anel. Um, we have a, a scholarship policy uh, in which we um, everything is spelled out. Uh, we um, I don't want to leave out any criteria, but it's important to bear in mind that middle and lower income nationals of middle and lower income uh, countries can be, are eligible for scholarships. Um, uh, staff and personnel working within organizations for development, governments, and uh, that are that have a, a specific task towards um, <coughs> gender mainstreaming. 
how gender equality issues that they have a responsibility within these roles and they will be able to the the learning and the 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 skills the knowledge acquired through the course can have an impact afterwards in the um, in the uh, work that they normally do within their organizations, within their gov governmental institutions, and uh, their aspects of in interventions. Uh, when you apply to the course and you give you, we uh, send you the admission uh, letter. We. Um, we we will send you all the information about paying the fees and all, all the information necessary which is down by bank by bank transfer uh, you can of course submit a, a recommendation letter for the application procedure and send it to the online to the uh, email mainstreaming.tc@unwomen.org that is um, that is uh, in the screen right now yes recommendation letters for uh, for uh, uh, applying for um, uh, a scholarship or to the course itself are always welcome and useful Uh, the payment is due, no, payment is not due by uh, February 24th, but by February 28th. So you, there is some, there's um, a little bit of, uh, there's more time for that. Um, okay, so we will, what I would um, suggest and ask you all is to stay in touch through the e-learning campus. Uh, um, and we will send in the e-learning campus. We will send you um, the information on the upcoming venues and the um, and the I mean the other places where the course will be held during the rest of the year. Um, thank you, Anel, for showing um, the e-learning campus. You can see that it's trainingcenter. dot uh, dot org. And here, um, if you sign up for the e-learning campus, you can receive. The um, the newsletter, and you can keep updated, be updated on all the news and the courses that we're doing. There are lots of resources um, and modules that you can um, also um, uh, that you can also have access to, and we invite you to also profit from this um, from this campus that has from this learning platform that has a lot of. Um, of resources and training courses as well. So I think I'm going to um, we're going to finish here because our um, date for today was for one hour. I want to thank everybody from all this all different places. I see that we have had many many participants, um, over 400 and at one point uh, 500 participants. Um, thank you all. I'm sorry that. We, not everybody was able to attend because we had over 1,800 registrants to the to the webinar today, and um, unfortunately we cannot take more than 501. But um, thank you all um, for um, sharing this um, this session with me, and I hope I have been able to address. Um, your questions and concerns, and we will post this um, webinar in the eLearning Campus as well. Thank you very much, and uh, we will um, definitely stay in touch. Thank you.